lean on us. We are here for you. You matter. You are not alone. Are you feeling overwhelmed? Not sure where to turn? The National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is there for you 24 7. Call or text 988 or chat at 988sc.org. Whether you're having an emergency or you know someone who needs support now, they can help you take the next step towards finding hope and healing. There is hope. 988sc.org. You know, like I said, the craft paused for a few minutes and then carried on. And, uh, and we went down the road to kind of made a pass towards Lake Houston. And, you know, I come up out the sea once we got some distance. And, you know, you could feel the heat off of it even inside the car. Uh, like I said, it, my grandmother, when she put her hands on the dad, she actually left the hand imprint on it. I think they contemplated about, um, once we got home, they contemplated about calling somebody and letting them know, and, and you know, of course, back then, everybody was going to think that we were the complete morons or whatever, so they were skeptical about that. Grandmother, she was always asking uh, about it. You know, she, she wanted to find out what it was, and she didn't care what people thought. And um, so, you know, they, like I said, she went on. I know my grandmother and I, they, she got to, to work for it. And I actually had to look through on my skin on her face. And, uh, I feel like something, you know, I had to mess up a few days of school out of it. It's, it's almost like a sunburn kind of feeling. You know, you get that flu symptoms when you get sunburned. Visit me at kellygreenrealtor.com or visit me on my Facebook page, Kelly Green Realtor. See you there. Hi, everybody. And welcome to another episode of Alien Strand Podcast. I'm your host, Donald Edesma. And welcome to today's show. It's been a while. Yeah. I decided to take a, I took a vacation, so that's why I got delayed a little bit here with Alien Strand, and uh, my apologies, but uh, it was for a reason that I did what I did, and the only reason I did that, not just to make you guys suffer or anything like that, but because I know you guys enjoy Alien Strand podcast, but I actually went back to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Pecos, New Mexico, and uh, where I, you know, 
where I saw like a lot of beauty out there. And then also, uh, I've spotted a few UFOs out there while I was living out there at a time, right? So I took my girlfriend out there and, uh, you know what? I decided to propose on her birthday and that's what I did. So now I am engaged. Yes, I am. And uh, you heard her at the beginning of this uh, podcast. Her name's Kelly Green. And, uh, you know, we make an awesome team together. You know, we have Let's Productions going and uh, a lot of things that we do with Alien Strand. And, and you know, she's just there. She's my sidekick and loves everything that I do. And, and I love everything she does. So, that was the reason. <laughs> so, anyway... Welcome to today's show, uh, and thank you guys for, for waiting and, and tuning in to Alien Strand Podcast. You can catch us on like 21, 22 platforms already. It grew another one. I believe we've got Amazon now. So check us out there. You can you can listen to the show there. Uh, you can catch us on Tumblr, Twitter, Instagram, Instagram, YouTube, and AlienStrand.com. Go check us out there. You know, we have a couple of videos on there. You might want to visit those and, um, and you know, just... Click a like and subscribe. We're going to try to get more uh, more content out there for you guys, okay? So, today's show, you know, I decided to talk about something that happens in the past, right? And I love these stories. You know, I really, really dig these stories. And the only reason that I dig these stories is because they have like a lot of authenticity to them and, um, you know... The, the stories are so like uh, genuine, you know, and there's just so many like witnesses and 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 things that, that you don't hear now these days. You know, a lot of these um, incidents that happen, you know, they happen to a lot of good people out there that, that don't really expect what's going to occur to them in the next five or ten minutes while they're on the road or, or you know, camping or whatever. Right. Or, or fishing, you know. So and that's why I like bringing in these older stories. So this story is uh, number 53. This is uh, the Cash Landrum incident. And I've heard about it before. And I saw it on Ancient Aliens and, and all those good stories. That young guy, you see the story on there pop up from, from time to time. Right? And um, I was just so intrigued about it because of exactly what happened to them, right? In that, in that incident. So... This incident happened on December 29th, 1980, right? That was about my time frame back in the day, right? It was a good year anyway. And the people we're talking about here that this incident happened to was Betty Cash, Vicky Landrum, and her seven-year-old grandson, right? Uh, his name is uh, Kobe, right? So, this uh, this this incident happened about on the, uh, on, I believe, the northern Houston area. It's like when you're coming out of Houston, out of 59 or 45, you'll see like a lot of woodsy areas. It's very openly out there. Um, you know, at the time, I'm sure it was even more so because you talk in 1980, you know, Houston has grown so much uh, from there, right? So, um and they were, uh, and it's it's almost like North Houston, but the southern tip of East Texas, right? So you're, that's the area that we're looking at. So they lived in, in Dayton, Texas in 1980. And they were on the road between 9 and 9.30 at night. Uh, they were on uh, FM 1485. between New Caney and Huffman if you're if you're familiar with that area and you know that that day was actually like a Monday it was a Monday evening um, you know Betty Cash and, and Vicky they're really really good friends for many many years so you know they um, they do this thing where they like to go to a bingo right so actually that night they were looking for a bingo hall so they can go and play and when they went, um, they went to go look for a, a game there in Cleveland, there in Houston. So uh, when they got there, they noticed that the it was closed, right? 
it's closer to the holidays. You know, they, they, uh, this is December, you know, 29th. Uh, so a lot of these places were closing down. They were still closed down for the holidays. So they said, well, let's just go ahead and find another place. So they headed to, towards Caney, uh, to find another bingo hall. And I believe this is heading towards North, right? So when they turned around and headed that direction, uh, they got to the bingo hall there and noticed that it was closed as well. Okay. So we're talking about eight o'clock at night by then. This is the time frame. And they had a little Colby with him in the back. Actually, no, he was in the front seat. So they said, well, it's closed. What else are we going to do? So they end up stopping at a uh, truck stop. They figured about it was, uh, the time was about 8 to 8.30 when they stopped at this truck stop because they were all hungry. They said, well, we might as well get a bite to eat. So they sat down, they ate dinner. And uh, after that, they decided to go back home. How long was Neil Armstrong actually on the moon? When did Europe start speaking English? Did Marco Polo really go to China? Curiosity Stream is the streaming service for all things history, plus science, wildlife, and more. What's the real story behind the Mona Lisa? We've got that. What caused the collapse of Rome? We know. Where did we find mankind's earliest ancestor? Come find out. For the holidays, get the gift of curiosity with 25% off gift cards for your curious cohorts. It's holiday shopping season at curiositystream.com slash gift. So they left the diner that night. And they said, Betty says, that they headed uh, down the road and it was about 12 miles when they spotted an object. So they were already 12 miles down this, this back road. And they saw something in the sky. Didn't think much of it, right? So they uh, they just kept on watching it as they went down the road. And they just couldn't figure what it was. That's what Betty and Vicky were, were saying to each other. Like, what is that? I don't know. What is it? They couldn't tell exactly what it was, but they saw this bright light. And this was on um, Highway 59 and 1485, which, which they were down. So when they were going down that road, they ended up making a small turn down this other county road. And lo and behold, they were heading dead center into this object that was still uh, descending down. Still couldn't tell what it was because it was a bright light. They said we could see it on the top of the trees. They have a lot of pine trees in that area. So you, you know how tall pines get. They said this craft or whatever this light was was above the trees and it was coming straight down it was slowly coming down and then they said when the craft came down it came down in the middle of the road where they were at so they hit the brakes at that moment they said this thing lit up the entire sky There's witness statements saying that they could see this light from 50 miles away. Betty and and Vicky says that the light was so intense, it was blinding, right? She said it was so bright and the heat of it was so intense, what they were looking at. And Betty, state, her statement says that at, that at that time, she thought it was the end of the world. She said there was no way to go but under it because this craft was hovering above the street. 
And she said there was a fire shooting from below this this shape of this craft. She says when it, it was an intense fire. It was coming out from the bottom of it. Remember, at this time, they stopped already. They're driving a 1980 Cutlass Oldsmobile. Big cars at the time. And then she says, Betty says, the craft was like a diamond shape. And she described it as a large water tower. So this is the size of this craft. It's right in front of them in the middle of the street, nine o'clock at night by then. And it's shooting fire from underneath. So they completely stopped. And they're looking at this thing. And they can feel the heat. She says it was as big as a water tower. And back then in 19, you know, 1980, water towers were about 175 to 200 feet tall. This is how large this craft was. She says it even burned the trees nearby. That's how hot this craft was. So at that time, Betty got out of the car to see the craft in front of her. So she opened the door, went to the front of her her vehicle to take a closer look. She says, I only got out just for a minute or so. And she said the heat was so intense, I couldn't bear it. She goes, I tried to get back into the car. She goes, but the handles on the car were too hot. I don't know if you remember those cars from back then in those days. There was a large handle across it. Almost looks like a door knob now, not a door knob, but a door handle on a glass door. That's how long they were. So this steel or metal that's on there is so hot she can't even grab it to get back in the car. So what she had to do is, luckily she had her leather jacket on. Remember, it's cold. She took it off and used it uh, on the door handle so she can pop the door open. She says at that time it was making like a a swoosh sound. Similar to air brakes on an 18-wheeler. So it was just going, you know, like just those noises while that fire was shooting out from underneath underneath it she was in the fire just kept shooting out from the bottom and then Betty said when she got back in the car the car was dead she goes I know I left everything running I didn't turn it off but when I got in there everything was dead she says at that moment When they all looked up at it, the car began to lift. And when it started to lift, Vicky began to scream. And then she said she put her fingers on the the dash to grab a hold while the car was starting to lift, right? She said the dash was so hot that her her fingers made an imprint on the dashboard of that car. Back then they were using like cheap plastics. Uh, they were just experimenting with those on dashboards. So you can imagine how hot it gets. So her pr- imprints of her fingers were still locked in to that dashboard. We're talking Vicky sitting on the passenger side holding on to Kobe. So 
So at that time, Betty finally got the car started, didn't put it in drive yet. But she said, I turned on the air conditioner right away to cool it down. Imagine that. She had to turn on the air conditioner in December 29th when it's cold out there, especially north uh, north of Houston, mid-Texas, December, it's cold. She said, but the inside of the vehicle was so hot that she had to luckily turn on the air conditioner to cool it off. She says the height of this of this uh, craft was about 60 to 80 feet. And she goes, and our car was about 130 feet from it. That's, that's not very far. So they were like really, really close to this object that was hovering above the road in front of them. She says that we were in front of that craft maybe for about 15 to 17 minutes, as she recalls. Because she says when they got home, it was like 10 till 10 p.m. So they weren't out there very long. Because she she always noticed that 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 that, uh, trip from that diner to her house is only 20 minutes, she says. Exactly 20 minutes. So they stood in front of this craft for about 15 to 17 minutes. With that heat so intense in front of it. I can just imagine that. The heat that was coming off of this thing. Have you ever stood in front of a fireplace or a fire in the outdoors? How hot that thing gets when you're really in front of it? That's probably what they were feeling. But in a hotter sense. Just as when they got back home, they decided to call Washington to report the object, right? 1980, calling Washington to report a UFO. She says, but they had no luck. Go figure, right? So later on, doesn't say the time frame, but they got a hold of a gentleman called Bill English with ARPO. A UFO research group. He's the one that dug into the story and broke it out for them. So they can try to report it or document it. You know, thank goodness for they they found this gentleman or else we would know these stories. A lot of these ufology, uh, ufologists out there or these uh, groups that are out there. If it wasn't for them, a lot of this information would not be out there. Because they're adamant about putting this uh, information out for us to know. And they said when they got home, they started feeling sick. Betty had blisters all over her head. Then, after a little bit, Betty started remembering that there was helicopters around this craft. You know, I guess because of the adrenaline that's going through you at the time when you're telling the story or when you're remembering, you don't remember these these other things that are happening as well, right? Because all you're thinking is is about this thing you just saw. So she said these helicopters were around this craft. She goes, I counted about 23. And she remembers on the side of these helicopters, these were these double propellered Helicopters. She says, I remember on the sides it said United States Air Force. 
Then Vicky corrected her and said, no. She goes, I counted 26 of them. So all these helicopters were following this craft after they ran into it. You know, why were these helicopters there? How did they know that this craft was in the area? Did radar pick it up? We had it back then. Did somebody see it? Yeah, there was a lot of witnesses that saw this after the fact. So these are the symptoms that I'm going to give you that they went through after this incident. So Betty explained that after this incident, she went to the hospital for about a month because of the blisters, diarrhea, upset stomach. She says, I was so weak and tired, I had no energy. And then she says, I, I, never, I could count the headaches in my lifetime. She goes, but this time I had so many headaches, I could not believe how, how many I was having. She says, I can hear a beeping sound in my ear, in my right ear, after this incident. She says, I felt burned and dehydrated and thirsty. Vicky claims her her arms were scarred, her eyes were burned. She developed cataracts and had a film around her eyes that burned her as well. She says, my eyes teared for about three months. Did you miss your deadline to renew your Medicaid coverage? You can still send your completed annual review form to Healthy Connections Medicaid. You may be assigned to another health plan but you can ask to come back to First Choice within 60 days of renewed Medicaid eligibility. It's your family. It's your choice. First Choice is the right choice. Renew and choose us. Visit selecthealthofsc.com slash renew to learn more. At that time, Vicki remembers... She says, this, I remember the craft now. She says, it, it looked like a flat aluminum. The only reason she remembered that is because she also stepped out for a quick second, like opened the door just to step out and look while this uh, incident was occurring. And that's the only reason she remembers the color of this craft. Now, I don't know if you've heard a lot of my podcasts in the past, but a lot of these witnesses that seen these uh, crafts in the sky or even up close, they always say it looks like a flat or a dull aluminum. She also suffered the same symptoms as Betty. She said, but I didn't get as weak as Betty did. She goes, because I had, I, uh, when we came back and Betty got sick, she goes, I, I had to take care of, of her, of Betty and Colby. This is Vicky saying. Now you ask, where was Colby through all this? Well, Colby was in the front seat with Vicky. He was seven. So she shielded him with her arm. So he couldn't get the intense heat that that he was uh, experiencing. He saw the light. He saw everything. But she shielded him somewhat. Because he only got burned on one side of his face. Where he got like little bumps. She says, little Colby had uncontrollable bowels. Like a one month old baby. He got fevers.
You know, they even took him to the doctors. The doctors couldn't explain exactly what was going on with him. You know, they were afraid to tell the doctors exactly what happened to them because they don't want people to think that they're crazy. 1980 we're talking about here. Vika says that she lost all her hair. And it took about a month before her hair started to grow back. You may ask why was Colby in the car at the time? Well, Vicky was raising Colby at the time. That was her son's little boy. At the time, you know, the mom didn't want to take responsibility. So she says, I took him in and I took care of him while my son worked. That's why Colby was with me. And Colby's statement, because they asked him as well, exactly what he saw. And he says exactly what they said. He said the lights on this uh, craft were reddish yellow. That's the only difference that he explains. You know, what is it that they experienced while they were out there? Why were there helicopters out there at that time, at night? You know, it's it's just a strange thing that happened out there in 1980, December 29th. To these folks that didn't know anything about UFOs or anything like that. They didn't know anything. They didn't even believe in aliens, she says. But this is Betty's statement. She says, well, I hope to find out what the object was and its purpose of it. And why was it there on the road at that time? And then she says, and God forbid, I don't want anything to happen to any of my family or friends, even you or your family. She goes, even to an animal. To what I had to go through. It would satisfy my mind to find out what it was and what it was doing there. I believe our federal government has got to have secrets. Betty Cash died in age of 71, December 29th, 1998. Coincidence? Landrum died at the age of 88 on 9-12-07. Colby still lives today. And he's out there giving out a few podcasts as well, if you can find him. His story is exactly the same as I just explained to you of what he experienced and what he went through and what he saw his grandmother go through. You know, here at Alien Strand, I always talk about these uh, crafts that are out there and that have been out there and have been witnessed so many times by these folks. And how they get sick. Radiation poisoning? Yeah, I think so. You know, when we see these things in the skies or in photos and videos, as I explained before, you know, we see these electronic magnetic fields all over them, right? This energy that's coming out around them. Is it radioactive? Yeah. I mean, it's burning the ground around it. 
It's killing the ground under it where things won't grow anymore for years and years. What does that? What happened to Chernobyl? Right? Meltdown. You know, a lot of you think of when you see these videos and you think they're fakes because you say, well, why would they have propulsion? Why is there a fire in the bottom of them? Right? This one had fire underneath it. Why would it not have propulsion? So, if you really think about it, as objects get closer to the ground, the, the ground, the air, is not as dense as it is up on top, right? So, this object gets heavier as it comes down. So, it needs some kind of propulsion to keep it from hitting the ground. Even though it can still levitate, it's still going to have properties of weight. And that's things that people don't put together. But I have. Because I believe that that's what exactly why you're seeing these propulsions on these bottom of these crafts. And what they saw and the experience with the heat and the swishing noise as it did that. Now they got sick for many years because of it. And everything that I read to you is from a recorded statement that they did at an Air Force base by there in Houston in 1981. And I'll put that transcript out after this podcast comes out so you can see it and read it for yourselves. Because this information came out of their mouths. Even little Kobe's at the time. And the only reason they wanted answers because they suffered a lot of traumatic effects from it as far as being sick, getting burned, cataracts. They saw the United States Air Force on the side of those helicopters. I don't know about you, but hospitals have a big bill. And that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to recoup their bills. Because Betty was in the hospital for a month. Now, she recouped a large bill, and so did uh, Vicky as well. So that's all they were trying to do was say, hey, who's going to pay for what happened to us? We saw this thing. Who's going to pay for it, right? So they did go to court for this. And the ending result is that the judge threw it out. The only reason was because she could not, they could not get evidence on the helicopters that were there. But this plot thickens just for a second. About a year later, they went to this, like a, um, like a festival of airplanes and helicopters. Well, a few months after, I'm sorry. And they walked up to this helicopter, or a few of them that were there, that looked exactly like the ones that they saw. Right? They met one of the pilots who didn't say that that's what he saw or what they were following or anything like that. Didn't never admit to it. But they noticed he had burns on his face and on his hands. So that gave them the notion that the government did know exactly what happened. They just didn't know exactly what it was, possibly, right? Can't give out that information. So that gave him a little bit of closure, knowing that they weren't going crazy because somebody else actually witnessed it. And 
And I'm glad that they found that out later. You know, things come out for a reason in that sense. And I'm glad they were able to get some kind of closure out of it. Knowing that something happened. Knowing that there were other witnesses in the area that saw the bright light. Pictures, the photographic evidence of the burned trees, the burned ground. This was afterwards. So I thought this was a real, real interesting story. And, you know, I had to get it out to you guys. Whether you heard it before or didn't know the slight details to this story. Well, I dug in there for you. Because I wanted you guys to get the whole story on exactly what came out of their mouths on their transcript. So, I hope you got a lot of information out of this story. And if somebody ever asks you about it, you could give them a lot of info about it. Because why? You heard it here on Alien Strand Podcast. You could point them to Alien Strand Podcast. Catches up on now 23 platforms. Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, YouTube, and AlienStrand.com. You want to get a hold of us? You can call us at 361 884 2000. Our number has changed. Yeah, I was just having a little bit of issues with that number. But give us a call. Send me an instant message. Send me an email if you want to be on the show. You got a story to tell about aliens, Bigfoot, ghosts. Anything that you want to get off your chest, an abduction, give me a call. We'll get you on the show and we'll get your story out there to everybody. Don't forget to download the Alien Strand app there on Google Play. It's free. You can catch all the Alien Strand podcasts on there. From now, 53 down, work your way backwards. It just, it doesn't go in any order, but check them out. Tell me what you think. Subscribe. Give me a heart. Give me a thumbs up on all those, right? But until then, you guys have yourselves a good day. Have yourselves a good evening. And have yourselves a good night.
Wake up at Holiday Inn Express to a can't-miss breakfast that's free with every stay. Count on all the hot, fresh coffee you need and an incredible breakfast buffet that has something for everyone, like eggs, cinnamon rolls, and even hot, fresh pancakes with all the toppings you crave. Next time, do yourself a favor and stay at a Holiday Inn Express with a can't-miss breakfast that's free with every stay. So, when you wake up at Holiday Inn Express, you'll wake up happy, a part of IHG Hotels and Resorts.